You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number five. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now, your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gautier. Hi everyone, today I speak with Denise Tryon, horn player and associate professor of horn at the College Conservatory of Music of the University of Cincinnati. Former fourth horn with the Philadelphia Orchestra, Denise has built a wonderful career which combines teaching, performing, and expanding the repertoire of her instrument through active commissions. Throughout her career, she has asked herself the hard questions and has not been afraid to step off the beaten path and shape her unique, meaningful, and impactful career. Prior to her position at CCM, Denise served as the horn professor of the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore starting in 2007, and she held positions with the Detroit, Baltimore, Columbus, and New World Symphonies. A graduate of the Interlochen Arts Academy and New England Conservatory, Denise is an accomplished solo performer and a skillful pedagogue. She is sought after throughout the world for her master classes, and she has taught extensively in the United States, Scandinavia, Europe, Asia, and South America. Denise co-founded Audition Mode, a yearly horn seminar with Carl Petuk, principal horn of the Detroit Symphony, and together they redefine what audition preparation entails for young students and professionals. Through her website, Denise offers an impressive amount of extremely valuable content on practice and performance. She also has a great YouTube channel and Facebook page filled with awesome practice videos. Her content is incredible, and I highly recommend that you visit all her platforms and check it out. Of course, I have links in the show notes for you. Denise released her debut solo album, So Low, in 2015. As a part of this album, she commissioned four new pieces for low horn and piano, and she continues to commission new works for the low horn for upcoming projects. In this episode, we discuss her journey from student to top five orchestra member, soloist, pedagogue, and catalyst in expanding the repertoire of her instrument. We also discuss practicing fundamentals and audition preparation. It is an information and inspiration-packed episode, and I hope you enjoy and find value in our discussion. Let's go to the show. Denise Tryon, I'm so happy to have you on the show today. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I came across your work for the first time over a year ago now, and you've been a great source of inspiration for me since then. You have these awesome excerpt of the week videos on YouTube, and you have short videos of performances and of you answering questions on technique, on social media. And I have to say, even though the videos are about horn playing and technique, I as a violinist, always find elements I can relate to and apply in my own practice. You know, actually, I would say that because they're not violent videos, they really draw my attention to things that are, you know, above the specifics of violent playing. They make me think about things from a different angle and they make me listen to myself in a way that I would say transcends the technicalities of violent playing. So I strongly recommend to everyone listening to check out your amazing content online and I'll put links in the show notes for sure. Great. Thank you. You know, I'm not just inspired by your skills as a performer and pedagogue. I find your whole story very compelling and inspiring. So before we discuss practice and music making, I'd love to hear about your musical journey and your career in your own words. So if you don't mind, would you please tell us about you and how you got to where you are and how your artistic path has unfolded? Absolutely. Okay, so I started playing piano when I was about five or six, something like that. My mom really wanted me to play piano. And uh, I enjoyed it for a little bit of time, uh, but really the piano was just not not for me. Um, and I played through probably the age of 16 or so. And the last few years that I played, I really only ever wanted to play Bach, which was great and yet drove my piano teacher nuts. Um, and so, and then I picked up the horn around the age of 12, but that came about because uh, it was time to pick an instrument at my school. And um, so I went in with my mom and I said, well, 
I really want to play the drum set. And my mom said, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> uh, I said, okay, then I want to play the flute. And she said, no, there are just too many flutes in the world. And she, she pointed at the horn. She's like, you're going to play that. And if my memory serves correctly, I started to cry. So uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, the, the case was funny shaped. And so anyways, but um, so I started playing at 12 and, and quickly realized that I, that I really liked it. Uh, I went to uh, Interlock and Arts Academy for my senior year of high school. And then I went to New England Conservatory for my bachelor's degree. While I was there, I became a member of a wind quintet. And uh, we applied once I was done with my bachelor degree, uh, we applied for the artist diploma program at NEC and we were accepted. We were the, uh, only the second group to ever be accepted. The first one was the Borromeo String Quartet. Um, mm. And it's a two year program, but uh, sort of towards the middle end of that first year, I was admitted into the New World Symphony, which is down in Miami Beach and a, a training orchestra for those of you who don't know that. Uh, and so I, I had to make a decision. Do I want to play orchestral or do I want to move forward with the chamber music? And I love chamber music. And, and I felt like at the time, it didn't seem like a viable option for a sustainable career. So you know, but what I sort of jokingly tell people is I wanted to play above a mezzo forte at some point in my career. So I got out of the woodwind only world and went <laughs> down to new world. Uh, so while I was there, I was there three years and I did a lot of uh, high horn playing. And for those of you who aren't horn players, there's a, there's a real split in the horn community. There are high horn players and low horn players. And, uh, and of course, you have to be able to do it all in order to win an audition, but you really are kind of specialized once you're sitting in the orchestra. And so now in my career, I'm a low horn player, but all through college and through New World, I was a high horn player. And I took a lot of uh, high horn auditions and did quite well, um, but I uh, decided to, in the middle of my third year, to go study with this woman uh, named Freudus Re Vecra, and I'll get into my teachers a little bit later. But while there, we sort of discovered that I needed to go through an embouchure change. And by the time I did that one, that meant I had done four embouchure changes in my life, which is, uh, it's like taking the violin and putting it into the other hand and saying, okay, figure out how to play. So I went through four of those between Interlochen and, and then my time in New World, so roughly about 10 years. And from high school up until this time, I, had a, I was very lucky to have some really incredibly strong female role models in the horn world. Uh, I studied with a woman named Marjorie Black, who uh, at the time was a freelancer in uh, Minnesota, which is where I'm from. And so she was my first main horn teacher. Um, and then I went and studied when I was at NEC, I studied with, uh, Chuck Kowalowski, who at the time was principal horn in the Boston symphony, but he was also a nuclear physicist. Uh, so yeah, that was interesting. Then he took a leave of absence my last year. And I studied with the tuba teacher at NEC, who was the tuba player in the Boston symphony, Chester Schmitz. And then while I was uh, sort of in New World, I took some time off and went and studied with Freudus. So I've had strong female and I've had sort of non-traditional teachers, uh, you know, studying with a tuba player. Um, and it was it really I feel like it really helped mold who I am as a player and who I am as a pedagogue. Uh, so as I was coming to the end of my time at New World, I started sort of taking every audition that came up. And uh, I won fourth horn in Columbus, uh, and I was there for two years. Then I was second horn in the Baltimore Symphony. I was there for three years. Then I was fourth horn in Detroit Symphony. Uh, I was there for six years. And then fourth horn in Philadelphia, and I was there for eight years. And while I was in Detroit, I actually started teaching at Peabody Conservatory, which is in Baltimore. A lot of people ask if I started teaching there when I was in the Baltimore Symphony, which would have made more sense, but I never do anything the easy way. So uh, every week I flew from Detroit to Baltimore to teach. Uh, and I did that for about three years. And then I got into Philadelphia and, uh, and then that made that commute a lot easier. And as time was going on and I was teaching very heavily 
And I was playing in, uh, you know, one of the top orchestras in the world, which has an extremely heavy schedule. I realized that something needed to change. I didn't have a lot of personal time uh, and I was just tired all the time and, and honestly a little bit cranky. So um, I made the decision to take a year off from the orchestra to see how it feel, how it would feel for me to teach full time and not play full time in an orchestra. And I knew fairly early on that this was the right road for me. So even though it was an incredibly hard decision uh, to resign my position from Philly, and it was really hard to press the send button to resign uh, with the email, I it was the right it was the right decision for me in the long term. Um, and then I was at Peabody full time for a year, and uh, not even quite a year, and this position at uh, CCM at the University of Cincinnati came open and it was one of my dream jobs. So I applied and uh, was beyond excited to win this position. So I started here uh, at uh, CCM just about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. Um, So then when I was in Detroit, I started a yearly week long horn seminar all about orchestral auditions called audition mode. And I started that with the principal horn in Detroit, whose name is Carl Pittock. And uh, people should go listen to his recordings of uh, the John Williams concerto and the Carrie Turner concerto. That's spectacular. Um, And during all of that was one of the things that we always do is give a recital. And so I wanted to be playing pieces that were in the, lower register to kind of showcase the the range that I'm so passionate about. And there's hardly any repertoire out there. So then I, I really started to get a passion for commissioning new works for the low register um, and whether it's unaccompanied with piano. And so I, I uh, commissioned a few pieces enough to sort of be able to make my first album, which is called So Low, huh? right? That's a good one. <laughs> um, and then I, I've recently, in the past few months, started commissioning some more works for a second album. Um, so that's, uh, that's my story. That's an amazing journey. You know, I, I love how you're not afraid to go beyond the beaten path and truly find the answers for yourself. I think it's really great that you found this niche that you loved and I guess what we, what we would call your zone of genius, you know, and mm. that you listened to your instinct and followed your passion. And I feel that what you do is so important because it really goes to show that, especially in 2018, we don't have to get settled blindly in the mold. And when you follow the breadcrumbs and you pursue these things that interest you and keep you inspired and motivated, you can really have an impact and make a contribution to the music world and build a career that is fulfilling and purposeful. In your case, I think you are really instrumental and, you know, pun not intended in Hmm. the growth of the repertoire (laughs) for the low horn by commissioning these new pieces and spend people's view of the instrument. I think that's, that's fantastic. Is there any other noteworthy project you're currently working on? You just mentioned a second CD. Yes, I'm, yeah, I'm working on a second CD. I put out a CD, a duo CD with my audition mode partner, Carl. Uh, we put that out, I guess it came out maybe in December of 2017. And so I was hoping to record this album in August, as in a month ago. But with moving to Cincinnati and and trying to figure out how to start in this, uh, with this studio, I just put it on the back burner for now. Uh, and so then I was hoping to do it this fall. We'll see. I'm still waiting on two pieces to be finished, uh, finished being written. So then of course I'll have to learn them and play them in a couple of recitals before I want to record them. So we'll see how quickly, how quickly it happens. Um, and then, Uh, One of the things that I also started was a bunch of online resources for people, uh, one of which is my personal routine, my warm up. That's in air quotes in case you couldn't see that warm up routine. And um, and then I started something that I call Lowhorns Unite. But it's it's basically just a place for people to be able to ask me questions 
Uh, you know, I'll put up some articles either that I've written or that I like. I'll put some videos up. Uh, people can send in uh, audio and video for me to give feedback. So it's a it's a way just for people to be able to connect with me and, and be able to ask me questions sort of anytime they want, which is I would have liked that when I was when I was uh, in school. For sure. Where can we find this Slow Horns Unite? Is this something on social media or through your website? It's through my website. Uh, it's actually through both the routine and this LHU, the Slow Horns Unite, is uh, on a platform called Thinkific. And, uh, you know, if you search that, you'll see either Slow Horns Unite. I can't remember if it's there under Slow Horns Unite or LHU, but probably Slow Horns Unite. And then also the routine is there. And those are two different, two different types of purchases. The routine is all inclusive and it's a uh, the pdf of it plus a video of me explaining why why each exercise is in there plus how i do it and then me playing it um and then there is audio only of me playing in case you'd like to play along with it as well and then lhu is a monthly subscription for uh just under 10 bucks a month wow that's really incredible. Actually, if there's anyone listening out there, that's a really great price for so yeah. much value and so much content. I'm going to put links for all of these things on uh, the show notes, and I'll definitely be on the lookout for this CD whenever it comes out. And, you know, this is a perfect segue because you just mentioned the DT routine, and this is exactly what I wanted to talk to you about to begin, because I see you as someone who's navigating this line between technician and artist so gracefully, you really take the time to understand fully what you're doing and what's happening. And I think, you know, I, I'm not sure I can't read your mind, but I feel like it allows you to really let the artistic message come freely in performance. And mm -hmm. I can't wait to dig into the art of practicing with you, but um good place to start is definitely the importance and the art of the warm-up routine. I always insist about this on, with my student and I myself have what I would call a uh, regular modular routine where I cover specific aspects of violin playing. And of course I have my favorite exercises, but I'll also vary them uh, for a little bit of fun and, and variety. But you have this great routine out there. Can you please tell us a little bit more about it and expand a bit on what you think makes a good warm-up routine and how one can go about building one that is efficient, maybe on a different instrument. Yeah. So for me, a warm-up and a daily routine are two different things. I feel like we can, we can get warmed up so that we're not going to injure ourselves in two to five minutes. You know, it's, we're not going to feel great, but we're not going to injure ourselves. We're going to get the blood flowing and the muscles going. So for me, I always start my routine. I have, I wrote down like the warm up that I do within that, which takes me probably about two and a half minutes. But um, because people were always asking me, what do I do specifically for that? So I wrote it down. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like as long as you can warm up the entire range of the instrument, that is, that's the point. Uh, and then for me, a good, routine covers as much of the fundamentals as possible. So you want to be sure that you, uh, you know, play high and low, that you play loud and soft, that you do articulation, you do some slurring or legato, um, that you have some flexibility in there, that you do some extended techniques. Uh, and some people really like long tones, Thing, I, I'm not a huge fan of long tones, but I always mention them because I know that some people really love them. Some teachers really love them. So for me, if it can incorporate all of that, then I think you're on the right road because I've often heard people do their warm up or their routine. And at least on horn, they're just doing uh, slurred. They're not doing any articulated and they're only doing sort of working through the harmonic series. So all the notes you can play on one fingering. Uh, and it just, I, I feel like there's so much more to the instrument and we need to be exploring all of that. And if, if you can do that, um, then I, I feel like everything else that sort of comes after that, everything that you're working on, 
you have all of the technique that you need. You just have to figure out how to piece it together from what you've done within the routine. So I've helped people set up their own routines. And, and I'll say that for me, I'm somebody that I could, I could eat the same thing every day. I could play the same thing every day and be happy. So uh, for me, a routine works really well. I mean, I've made small modifications over the years and added some things that I really felt were lacking, but I've been doing this same routine for uh, 28 years, something like that. Long time. Uh, And I feel like it is the biggest key to my success on the horn. Uh, I feel like just really, it keeps me in great physical shape. So what I do is I, you know, when people want to make their own routine is you want to just find a series of exercises that you like. Now, sometimes the phrase you like means something that you maybe can't do. Uh, Maybe that you feel like touches on a part of your technique that's weak. And we try to put them, I try to put them in categories for people like, okay, is this high or low? Is this articulated or slurred? Is this loud, soft? And piece together something that will work for them. And maybe there is, a, maybe there are a few exercises that you can rotate through so you don't get complacent or be bored or something, mm-hmm. something along those lines. And I know that, uh, some people's routines are, you know, maybe an hour long. I find that if I have to do an hour of routine playing before I'm allowed to sort of do anything else, that feels, uh, I I just, I feel overwhelmed by that. So I like to keep a routine to about 30 minutes, maybe, you know, a little bit less, maybe up to 40, but you know, I, I prefer sort of the 30 30 minute mark, because that's a nice, you sort of really get into it. And then you can still do some more after that before your first practice session is done. So that's how I, that's how I approach it. And I have exercises from different teachers. I have exercises from different books in, in my routine, things that I find work, but I put in a bunch of alternate versions of how you can do each of these exercises, because I know that sometimes people can get a bit bored. Uh, so that's the that's the story of my routine. And that's such great advice because, as you mentioned, it's keeping these fundamental uh, elements strong that's at the base of everything that we do. And again, as you mm-hmm. said, it's so easy to get injured if we don't appropriately approach the instrument and wake up the muscles and warm up you know, the whole, uh, mm-hmm. the whole body before the work and covering the fundamentals. I know for violins, it would be making sure there's some, I mean, I'm a big fan of long tones because it really warms up my bow arm, you know, but some bow arm mm-hmm. exercises and left hand and scales, arpeggios and double stops. And um, when you mentioned extended technique, what would that be on the horn? So that would be uh, lip trills, which um, lip trills is when I, instead of, it's usually whole steps, whole steps are done with uh you use the same fingering for both notes and then you just move your move your armature to wiggle back and forth uh versus a finger trill and lip trills it can be quite slow for people to get that technique under their under their belts and i will say that for me my lip trill wasn't truly reliable until i was in my early 30s uh i just kept working on it every day and and eventually it came around uh, that would be one thing, uh, multiple articulation. So anything that's really fast and you have to, instead of just doing a series of T's in a row, you have to do a TK or if it's a triple tongue, TTK, TTK, uh, some people like stopped horn. So that's when you close the, the bell off with your hand and it actually transposes the pitch. So you have to play different fingerings to get the pitch that you want, but figuring out how to make that sound really nasal, that is something that's quite challenging to get to figure out because everyone has such different hands, different sizes of hands, Mm -hmm. and how to close that off so that as little air as possible is escaping and you're in tune is can be challenging. Um, So those are just some examples, you could also do multiphonics, which then you play a note and you're singing a note at the same time to try and get uh, double stops, basically. 
And uh, I think sort of the last one that I can sort of think of would be flutter tongue, where you're just uh, like rolling an R for a long period of time while playing a series of notes. And it gets asked for a lot in uh, in Mahler and um, some later later works. So those are some examples. So not necessarily exercises covering things that you might use every day, but that you strengthen over time. So when they do occur, you have this, you know, the knowledge and the skill to do it. Correct. Yeah. If you if you wait until something comes up, I mean, if you think about my career, if I waited to work on lip trills until I needed it, I could probably go a couple of years without practicing a lip trill because in orchestral playing, it just, it just, I don't know if there is a piece that requires a lip, lip, a lip trill for fourth horn. Mm -hmm. uh, and once in a while, principal horn will have to do something, but for the rest of us, not, not so much. So, and since I know that's such a, mm, a challenging uh, technique for me personally, I practice it every day to make sure that I stay on top of it. Because I don't want to be penned in by, oh, well, I only do these things. Therefore, those are the only things I'm going to practice. If you only practice what is required of you, you're playing and your world becomes very small. And then when something does get put on your plate that is more challenging, then, uh, you know, suddenly it's like, whoa, that's a big stretch for me. And I don't, I don't want to feel like that. It's such a great reminder for all of us. You know, there's a great violin pedagogue called Simon Fisher. And in one of his videos, he talks about how building the skill to do something is a little bit like taking medicine every day. So you just build on it. And I love this analogy. And, you know, it's such a great reminder because there's so many of these little, what you call extended technique that are required for all instruments. And we don't practice them every day, but by just, I mean, even just one minute a day on a specific stroke at the end of the year, it adds up to a lot of time spent yeah. on it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. So as uh, we talked about, you've been, you know, teaching Peabody Conservatory and now at the Cincinnati Conservatory, which looks like a big studio from the pictures. Yeah. How many? Yeah, 25. I have 25 students. Wow. Uh, which means that I have an adjunct that works with me. Uh, and the way I'm doing it is that basically every student gets three lessons a month with me and one lesson a month with my adjunct who uh, this year is, uh, his name is Jonas Tomes. And, you know, and, and sometimes it's, you know, he comes in two weeks after he came in the first time, but over the semester, it works out to be uh, once a month with him and three times a month with me. And that way I feel like I am the, the driving force in how people are moving forward and through their, their education and the, and Jonas, the adjunct is, is coming in and being like a coach mm. and uh, you know, hearing, giving his thoughts on what he hears, but also trying to um, cement some of the things that I'm talking about. So we, we keep extensive notes about what we're working on and why we're working on it and what we see on each student so that we're, we're up to date on what each of us is thinking. Wow. So I want it to be as like collaborative of a process as possible. And I love how you worded that, how you help them move forward and through because our, our teachings or the teachings that we received stay with us our whole life. So I'm guessing it's the same thing with our students yeah. as well. And there's so many times where I found myself you know, five years after graduation, finally thinking I'm starting to understand one concept that my teacher was talking to me about. Yeah. Um, and when you talk to these students about practicing, about mindful and efficient practice, what what do you tell them about it? Like how, what, when, what kind of tools, what, mm -hmm. what do you think mindful, efficient practice is? Well, I think the the older I get and the more I see students and remember who I was at that age, I think it's really important to remember who you were and what your feelings were as you were 18, 20, 25 in that, in that range. Um, I think it's it really important to be demanding of yourself, but be kind to yourself as well. 
too often I find that students talk to themselves in a way that they would never talk to another person using those same words. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that first and foremost, we are our own teachers. So for, for your whole life, you have you as a teacher, you might as well accept it and figure out how to be the best teacher for you that you can be. Um, but the, the more when you're in the practice room, I actually really will lay out for students who have a hard time sort of, some people have a hard time sort of figuring out how to lay out their practicing. I, I talk about what I call the 55 and out program. And that is, uh, I mean, as horn players, we don't have, we can't practice six, you know, six hours a day. We really have a limited, the muscles are so small and, uh, you know, it's very limited what we can do. So, um, I say you try, you want to try and do roughly about three sessions a day. If this is what you want to do with your life, if you want to be a musician for your life, three sessions a day, each one is 55 minutes. So you do roughly 25 minutes. You take a five minute break. You play another 25 minutes. Boom. You're done. Adds up to 55 minutes. You're done for that. That session, you wait a few hours, you do it all over again, wait a few hours, do it all over again. And uh, I, I like to approach my practicing and I like to instill in my students that they approach in their practicing that it's more of a mathematical or a scientific equation rather than attaching the ego to it. It's like, you know, if you can't do something, then you're not worth X, Y, and Z. So instead of thinking that, try to figure out the three questions I always ask people to ask themselves is what happened? You know, was that something out of tune? Did you miss a note? Was your articulation not clean? You know, figure out what it is that happened. Why did you stop? Then ask, why did it happen? Um, you know, and that sometimes can be a little bit uh, a little bit challenging of a question to ask yourself to figure out what that is. And then how do I fix it? And I feel like that part, that's where all the experimentation comes in, where all the creativity can come in to our practicing. You know, you try okay, this time I'm going to try using different air. Okay, you know, you try it. How did that work? What did I discover? Okay, this time I'm going to try and use a different type of articulation. Did that get the result that I wanted? And so on and so forth, so that they can just sort of check off, well, I tried all of these things, and this is this combination is what worked for me, and keeping a practice journal helps when that comes about. But really trying to take the ego out of it, and it's, I find it's, the most challenging sort of at this high school and college age, because there's a lot, especially once you decide you want to go into it, there's a lot of pressure resting on this decision. And, you know, am I going to make it? You just don't know how your life is going to turn out. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety around that. So trying to keep that anxiety out of the practice room is one of the best things that you can, you can do for yourself. Because it's so counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And there are usually four elements that I look at when somebody's playing for me. And so I ask them to look at that for themselves, which is um, there's the technique sort of uh, branch. There's your physical branch, like, you know, are you holding tension somewhere? There's your musical branch. Or, you know, are you creating nice phrases? Do you have an idea of what kind of phrase you want to play? And then there's the mental. And depending on what a student, when a student's playing for me, I can sort of feel what's coming out of them the strongest. You know, so sometimes I'll work with somebody on getting, a, you know, a particular type of air, a particular type of articulation, or a particular kind of slur, intonation, something like that. Then there's, you know, a look and are they holding tension somewhere? And is that causing them to not be able to put forth the technique that, I know they have, you know, some people are just have a harder time figuring out how to build a phrase uh, and that you can teach that, but it, but it requires the student to do a, you know, a lot of work. But for me, the mental is the, it, is the biggest component. So I actually have a, a set of words that I don't like to be said in my, in my <laughs> studio. And I call them, I call them swear words, but, uh, and I keep threatening to get a swear jar and then we'll take the money and have a big horn party at the end of the year. But, uh, so I don't like the word hate and that means, oh, I hate this piece. I hate the horn or insert instrument here. I hate the way I played that, uh, something along those lines, not, oh, I hate rain, whatever. Uh, it's beautiful and sunny out. I don't know why I said rain, but 
then, so that's the first word. And then the second one is the word perfect. I don't want to play it until it's perfect, or I didn't like it because it wasn't perfect. I truly don't know what perfect is. I've been to a concert where the person next to me just thought it was perfect and I didn't like it at all. So I feel like perfect is such a subjective thing. And most people, when they're talking about perfection, they're talking about playing all of the right notes. Mm -hmm. And when you think about your, the performances, the live performances that have really moved you, there are, there are probably some notes that go by the wayside or maybe a little bit of intonation that goes off. But if that person is just so committed to their musical content, you forget all of those things. So for me, what is perfect? You know, I'm, anyways, I got off on a tangent <laughs> on that one. Uh, the next one is sort of a, a, a twofer, but should, shouldn't. Uh, and it's really, I find it's really common in um, kids of the same age. So if you have, you know, a, a three, three students that are all juniors and one of them has an incredible high range and the other two don't. And they're like, well, so-and-so has a great high range. I should have that. Uh, or this person has a great uh, lip trill. I should have that. And I just feel like everyone's on their own road. And when you learn things and how you learn things is, a, is completely different. And allow yourself that time and don't really compare yourself to other people. So that's why should, shouldn't is not allowed in here. And the last one is a challenging one for me, which is the word mm. control. And I, of course, want to feel like I'm in control of my mind and of my body, but I don't want to try to control things, which that's where I feel like people get into trouble. When they just, they try to control aspects of their playing or of their life, and it just doesn't work. It actually makes it much worse. So find the flow and and just commit to it and and you'll be happier and you'll be a better player long run. And what's interesting with this control too is that it goes back to this need to play perfectly. And even in, in audition playing, people think they have I feel like I feel like it's a misconception. They feel like they have to play perfectly, but it's so much more than that. I feel like a committee needs to see that yes, you are a great technician that you are able to handle the technicalities of the instrument, but they want to see a musician, someone who's making music and, and has ideas mm -hmm. and understands the, um, the concept and the context of everything, how your voice fits within the orchestra. Yeah. It's so much more than making sure you're playing perfectly and trying to play perfectly, I feel, you know, causes the opposite where we do end up Uh, yeah. feeling like we're in a box and there's not that flow that you're talking about, which makes everything more difficult. Yeah. When you're not in the flow, I mean, I usually equate it to, you know, if you're kayaking down a river and you suddenly decide you want to go against the current, you have to use so much more energy and you hardly go anywhere where if you would just go with the currents and of course You don't want the boat to tip over. You know, you want to stay in control of the boat, but you want to be going along just with this river. And I feel like if, if we could, if we could find that in our own playing, it's, it just, it makes a lot of the things that we stress about actually just fall into yeah. place. There's so many great things in what you just said to even going back to the 55 and out. I really like this. Actually, I will most likely steal that from you, but I, I'll give you credit. I promise. But mm. I love that it kind of Thank gives you. the student this permission to, or even professionals, you know, sometimes you don't want to start practicing because you feel like it's such a big chunk of time ahead. But if you break it down, it's much more manageable, therefore a little bit easier to motivate ourselves to get in the studio and practice. But I feel like it also helps with mm -hmm. this concept of spaced repetition where you walk away, you let things settle a little bit, be absorbed by the brand and then go back and re-stimulate everything. I, I just, I love that. And you know, not letting the ego gets in the, get in the way as you know, what we were just talking about. Yeah. And these four elements that you were referring to the technique, physical, musical, and the mental we have to address all four of these things in the practice room. Yeah. And we so often get narrow uh, minded and focus on one more than the others. And they are very, um, I don't know if that's a word in English, complemental to each other. 
they complement each other. Um, sure. But oh, yeah, so much great stuff. Well, and I find that people really don't want to address the mental. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I'm not sure why. I mean, I, I will say that it was the because by the time I went to go study with uh, Freudus over in Norway, I was very negative. I mean, I can't even say a word that show, that explains how negative I was. And working on that mental side was by far the hardest work I've ever done on the instrument. But it has not only helped my playing, it's helped my personal life immensely. So I feel like working on those things, even though it's very uncomfortable for a lot of my students to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to talk about it and, and challenge people to uh, see how they're actually undermining their, their playing by what it is that they're saying to themselves or what they believe. Yes. So powerful. We even, I think, get lost in playing of the instrument and we forget the purpose. Like, why are we doing this? Yeah. yeah you mentioned earlier the um, really great audition workshop that you do with your colleague from Detroit Symphony, Carl Petok. I hope I'm saying this name right. Can you talk to us a little <laughs> bit about that and you know how it came about and what you think some key elements are in preparing for an audition? Yeah, so between Carl and I, I think we've taken roughly somewhere in the 70 to 75 audition <laughs> range. Oh, that's painful to say, but it's true. So we felt like... and. He's won, I don't know what, five five auditions and been runner-up to many others. And I won uh, four auditions and was runner-up many other times. So we felt like we had a lot of knowledge and that there was a real lack of this type of a camp or seminar. Uh, so kids weren't really learning about this. They were learning how to play excerpts, but there is a lot more to playing a, a good audition than just playing the excerpts. So... We started talking, and it took us a, bit, a little over a year to sort of really develop what we wanted to do. And we started in 2009, so this summer will be our 10th year doing it, which is uh, amazing to me that the time has gone that fast. And it has we've monkeyed with the uh, the length and all of this a few times, trying to get it trying to get it right because it is a very intensive week. We do two two lists, two mock audition lists, one for high horn and one for low horn. And everyone has to do both lists. So you can't just come in and pick the one that you're more comfortable with, which is what people's tendency is. So you have to do both. And uh, we do master classes on every single one of the excerpts. We also do a couple of master classes on concertos. The, and we'll ask for specific concertos. We'll include a section, uh, several master classes on section playing, because often in final rounds for, for winds and brass, you are playing in a section to see how you fit in with that particular orchestra. So there is a real knack to figuring out how to go from the soloist stage, which is when you're playing excerpts, you have to think of yourself as a soloist, regardless of what position you're applying for, and then how to become uh, either a good leader if you're applying for a principal spot or how to be a good section mate. And we do a couple of lectures on preparation, on uh, resumes, and uh, we, of course, always tell some horror stories uh, from our hmm. audition days. And then at the end of the week, um, we do two mock auditions. It's screened. We do a couple of rounds and uh, we, at least so far, we've always picked a winner in each of the auditions. So that in a nutshell is what that, what that week looks like. It's uh, usually about six days long. And uh, we, uh, Carl and I always start the week off by playing a recital because we want to try and inspire some people about, uh, about playing so we always start the week off with uh, with a recital. And then it's just like, it just goes on all day long. It's so much information. Um, 
So it's, it can get a little bit tiring for people, but a good tiring, like, you know, then you have a lot of information and you get inspired for the whole year to go and practice. Uh, so we talk, you know, we talk a lot about, um, and we also talk about uh, negotiating your contract, which at least in the United States, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can be negotiated in to a contract. So it's always important to do that because in my first job, nobody had told me that I could negotiate. And so I just signed whatever contract they sent me. I'm sure they were very happy that I had done that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So it's, uh, and Carl and I are like a a weird comedy team together. I can't tell which one of us is the straight man and which one's the funny, the funny one, but it goes back and forth. And uh, yeah, it can get a little, it can get a little punchy in there, but uh, but yeah, so, you know, for the most part, we have, we have a lot of fun doing that. And uh, it's been really, we've had people come back uh, for a couple of years, um, you know, wanting to, wanting to learn more, wanting to get inspired. And it's just a lot of the stuff that we talk about just isn't being talked about in school or of course, once you're out of school. That's amazing. It sounds like such a comprehensive program, you know, and I even love the name audition mode because you know, preparing for an audition does require a specific mindset and, you know, you, you do go into audition mm-hmm. mode. I, that's a great, and it sounds like you're really helping the student push out of their comfort zone. And the fact that you're encouraging this versatility is so important. I'm trying to think if we have a similar thing on, on the violin, but I guess it would be more of, um, you know, we, it's like you say, we have to be prepared to cover any style, any, um, different type of articulation, any character. So that sounds like a great program. Yeah, it's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And I always feel at the end of the week, usually right before the week starts, I'm always like, oh my gosh, this is so much work. What am I doing? And then the week, the week ends and I, and I was like, that was great. Let's do it again. So uh, I'm always, I'm glad that I end on an up note and feel like, okay, let's do it again. Because if I felt... <laughs> If I felt as drained at the end as I did at the beginning, then it probably wouldn't happen again. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this, Denise. Yeah. How about a quick round of rapid fire questions before we wrap this up? So for the people Absolutely. who are dreaming of becoming, you know, a horn player, whether it's a, a solo horn player or orchestra player, can you tell us a little bit about what your life looks like? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I found that the most interesting part about um, becoming a professional was it, it actually was really hard to figure out how to manage my chops Mm. around my schedule. Uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't as free to just practice as much as I wanted whenever I wanted, because I had to be on at certain points. So, um, I'm always sure that before I start teaching or before I travel or something like that, I, I always make sure to get my routine in and be sure that I, that I give a little something to myself. And, you know, depending on what it is I'm working on, I, you know, I, I might be, I might not have any sort of performance on my schedule for maybe a month and I'll be practicing a lot of etudes. Um, and then I'm always trying to play some things that my students are working on so that I can demonstrate well. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, and it, and it does mean that after I get home from a long day of teaching, when what I'd really like to do is have a glass of wine and sit and talk with my husband, it means that I, I have to go back into the practice room uh, to do a little bit more work for myself so that I can uh, maintain the level of playing that I want to maintain. But then I get to go and I get to meet great people in this country and all around the world playing chamber music and concertos. And uh, yeah, I just, it's a really it's been a really great life, you know, getting, getting to meet new people, getting inspired by people. And uh, I I wouldn't trade it for anything. Is there a performance that has stayed with you throughout the years? You know, I think there are, there are a couple that come up for me. The first one is I played when I went to um, Interlochen camp in the summer, right before my senior year, I played Tchaikovsky six and Mm. it's so gut wrenching that I remember, you know, and that's a time in your life when a lot of changes are happening. And, and I was just so inspired by that performance and so moved that that's actually the performance that made me decide 
to try to become a musician. It was just so, it was so powerful because I thought I was going to be an electrical <laughs> engineer um, at that point in my life. So, uh, so that turned out a little differently, but then, but then I will say that playing Beethoven nine with uh, Raphael Fubeck de Bergos was just still, it was the first time I'd played the fourth horn solo in Beethoven nine. And I got to play it with one of the most incredible musicians that I've ever worked with. Uh, and uh, it was just very special. I will, I'll never forget that, that performance. I have a similar experience with the Tchaikovsky symphony, a different one, but uh, we have that in common. Mm, nice. Do you have a favorite tool in the practice room? Yeah, I have two. Anybody who's heard me talk knows that I am in love with the metronome. I have three <laughs> different types of metronomes, depending on, on what I want to work on. I have one on my phone because it's easy. You know, it's, it's always with me and it's, and it's there. Uh, I have a Dr. Beat for, you know, more complicated things. And then I have an, uh, an older, old-fashioned one that stands up and the arm ticks back and forth. But I bought it in Japan, so it's this, like, eggshell blue colored, and it's got this cute little ding. So it just makes me happy to, like, see this little arm waving in front of me and hear this cute ding. So that makes me happy when to, uh, you know, to work with that metronome. But for me, if, if you can't play in time with you, how am I supposed to play in time with you? So great rhythm is just is the bedrock of everything that we do. I know that was three, but that's one category. And the other one is something specific to brass players, and it's called a burp. Uh, and it stands, I feel like I would have liked to have looked this up, but it stands for something, buzz, extension, something, something. And it's a. it comes in two versions. There's a metal version and a plastic version. And basically you put your mouthpiece into it, And you attach it to your instrument so that no air is going into the instrument, but you're still holding the instrument uh, like you normally would. And you're buzzing into the mouthpiece and you can finger along if you want. It doesn't really matter if you do, but you can tell if you're hitting the right pitches or not. Because if you're putting bad information with your buzz into the horn, you're going to get bad information out. So for me, that just brings it right to a point. Are you buzzing the note that you're supposed to be playing? So those are my two favorite, two favorite tools to use in the practice room. I definitely agree with you on the metronome. And I love that last one. It's such a great way to stay mindful and fully present when you practice. What about skills that you yeah. think young musicians yeah. studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? Well, it's just, you know, I mean, of course, for young people coming up now, it's, it's not a changed world because this is, they know they grew up with social media. They grew up with computers and phones. I did not. So um, there's a lot to learn on that front. And I think that social media is a tool that can be used well, or it can come back to bite you in the butt. So if you use it well, you can actually grow an audience that is interested and um, active in what, what you're doing. I mean, because who, who would have thought 20 years ago that you could be, you know, kind of a low horn specialist and make a name for yourself. That is really, really unusual, but it's because of social media. Having said that, I, you can't have a strong social media presence if your playing is subpar. So, I mean, of course it goes without saying you just have to be, work really hard at your playing, but how to market yourself is, is one of the things that I think everybody needs to learn and, uh, you know, how to have your own voice within that and try not to try not to just copy what somebody else is doing. So figuring out how to, how to market yourself, because I think now's a great time to be a classical musician. You can create your own chamber music group, orchestra or series, and like actually make a living doing it. But in order to do that, you have to be able to market what it is that you're doing. So for me, that's the biggest, that's the biggest one. And you're a great example of how you can really define what your career is. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked and I think that the reason that that happened is because I listened to myself. I listened to my instincts and sort of what, what doors open for me and 
and then I decided to walk through them instead of staying with something that, you know, I, I thought I, and at one time I did want to be an orchestral, uh, you know, musician for my career, but at some point that changed. And I, if I didn't listen to that voice, I would have just stayed there and I probably would have stopped teaching, but I'm, I'm much happier being able to do this. And I have a lot more freedom in my life because of that. Mm. Amen. <laughs> and, you know, also, I think you listen to yourself, but you work very hard as well. So mm. it's not just wishful thinking. It's right. working towards a dream in the way that takes you there. I love that. Yeah. How about a favorite book that you would recommend to the listeners? And it doesn't have to be a music book. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I will say, I mean, of course, there are always the, the traditional ones like the inner game of tennis and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I wanted to go a little bit non-traditional with this, which uh, is a book called The Music Lesson. It is about music, but The Music Lesson, and it's written by Victor Wooten, who is uh, an electric bass player. And he plays with Bella Fleck, who's a banjo player, in case anyone doesn't know Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Uh, and it's incredible. And I, and he runs his own camp. I, he has like a, a, a large ranch or something, maybe in Tennessee. I can't, I can't exactly remember, but it's an incredible book and it, it approaches music in a way that classical musicians don't think about music. So for me, I love, I love this book and I've actually had my students read it a few times, like read it as a, as a group. And then we like discuss it together. Mm. So that's my favorite book. I didn't know that book, but I'm going to go check it out as soon as we get yeah. off this call. Yeah. <laughs> and how about a piece of advice that you received and that you would like to pass on to our listeners? Well, I've got, I've got a few of those. Um, and some of them I've already touched on a little bit, but Uh, so I would say the first and foremost is you want to strive for excellence, not perfection. Mm. And that's, you know, and I've talked about that, that perfect gene. And, uh, I, I can't tell if mus classical musicians become classical musicians because they have this weird need for perfection or somehow through the process, we become perfectionists. I can't figure out what, which came first, the chicken or the egg in this one, but striving for excellence Uh, is, is a much better way to sort of move your career forward. Um, and then uh, another one is uh, change your mind and your body will follow. Mm. You know, if you, if you think you can't play something, you probably can't play it. But if you think that you can play something, then the chances of you doing it greatly improve. Uh, and both of those, both of those actually are from, are from Carl, Carl Pittock, the person that I run audition mode with. And then the last one is, um, uh, which I've already mentioned, is be demanding and caring of yourself when you're when you're practicing and when you're performing. Be demanding. Hold yourself to a, a high standard, uh, and talk to yourself in a way that is kind. Words to live so, by. Right. <laughs> How about a quick actionable tip that listeners could implement today in their practice room or in their musical lives? Yeah. So the And I've said this for a long time, and again, I, I, I sort of mentioned it earlier, but in your professional life, give to yourself first. If you give to yourself first, it will allow you to give more to others. So if you have to, if you have a class really early in the morning, you have an 8 a.m. class, get into the practice room at 7. Do your 55 and out before you go to that 8 a.m. class. I know it's tough, but you're going to feel better about yourself. And you're going to, um, you know, just feel like you've accomplished something by the time you walk into that first class and then have to sit there and, and take notes or do whatever. So give to yourself first and then you'll be able to, it will help you to give more to others. Mm -hmm. That is truly awesome. Thank you, Denise. Absolutely. And where can people find you and connect with you? So on Facebook, uh, Denise Tryon Horn is my professional page. On Instagram, it's uh, DT Lowhorn. And on Twitter, it's also DT Lowhorn. And uh, we have some audition mode. Uh, we have uh, an Instagram, which is AM Duo. And then we have a Facebook, which is audition mode. So you can find out information there. 
Of course, I have a website, denisetryon.com, and then audition mode is auditionmode.com. And then there's Thinkific, which is the routine and the LHU, the Low Horns Unite. I think I covered everything. Oh, and YouTube, and I have a YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the show notes with all of these things. Great. Denise, thank you so much for taking the time thank to chat you. with me today. I really appreciate it. Um, I wish we had more time, but you are a really wise person, my friend, and you're <laughs> a trailblazer. I feel totally inspired, and I'm sure everyone listening will feel it too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode at mindoverfinger.com. I would also love to connect with you, so join the conversation on social media. Let me know what inspires you, what specific questions you have about mindful practice, and what other topics and guests you would like to hear about in future episodes. I am Mindoverfinger on all platforms. Next week, I'll be talking to Matthew Lippman, solo violist and member of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, and we discuss his development from beginner to world-class artist and practicing mindfully in preparation for both competitions and performances. If you've liked the episode and think that it has brought you some value, please take a minute to head over to iTunes to subscribe and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Again, thank you and a bientôt.